Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mayor Rich Hill from the Village of Raleigh Beach, uh, and welcome to our fireside chat for uh, April of 2017. Uh, tonight, my guest is Congressman Brad Snyder. He re represents the Illinois 10th District in the United States House of Representatives, where he's serving in his second term. Prior to being elected to Congress, Brad spent more than 20 years in business and management consulting, helping large and family-owned businesses alike address the challenges of today's economy and plan for the future. His professional experience allowed him to see firsthand the challenges small businesses face when trying to hire new workers and grow their company, as well as the effect thriving small businesses can have on a community's overall economy. At home, Brad has deep ties to the community, including service with organizations such as the Jewish United Fund, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Waukegan Public Library Foundation, BEST, the Coalition to Reduce Recidivism, and the Civic Leadership Foundation. Brad earned a BS in industrial engineering and his MBA from Northwestern University. Brad and his wife Julie have been residents of Deerfield for more than 25 years, where they created a home, built their careers, and most importantly, raised two sons, Adam and Daniel. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, it's good to be here. And tonight we have some moderators from uh, Ron Lake Area High School. We have uh, Leslie Diaz and Doriana Rivera. Welcome. And at this point, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Um, the the first question to start of this evening is for Congressman Schneider. Can you please give us an overview of the geographic boundary of the district you were elected to serve? Sure. Uh, thank you, Doriana, for the question. Before I answer, let me just say thanks to both of you for taking the time to be here. And let me thank and welcome everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, it's really nice to have this opportunity to sit in a very casual uh, format to talk about issues that are, are important to you. Um, it is a great honor to be back representing the, the 10th district. I, I love the district. We were talking earlier about how diverse the district is. To your question, we have a, a map over here. Uh, the, the district, um, by our standards, is fairly large. I will tell you there are districts around the country that extend 800 miles. Um, wow. So I will take our, our district uh, in its compact size. I can get it from my home in Deerfield, which is on, on the southern part of the district, to it, literally anywhere in the district without traffic in less than an hour. With traffic, as you know, who knows? The county? <laughs> right. Who knows? You, you use a calendar instead of a clock at that point. But um, the district goes on the, I'm going to divide it in three parts. If you look along the lake, at the southern tip, it is uh, Glencoe, the southern border of Glencoe. All the way up to that top straight line is actually the border with, with Wisconsin. Uh, if you shift a little to the center, where it goes a little bit further to the south, that's along uh, 94, 294. The southern um, line is Dempster, Des Plaines, Niles, a little bit of Morton Grove, comes up through Northbrook and uh, Wheeling, uh, Glenview are, are the Cook County communities. Um, and then the middle bite, if you will, is at Route 120. And at Route 20, we go all the way west uh, to Fox Lake. Uh, if you look at it closely, uh, does anyone see that it kind of looks like a baker holding a cake? And, and if you look really closely, there's even a little candle in Lake Villa um, there as, as well. So that's the district. The next question is for both Congressman Schneider and Mayor Hill. One of the purposes of these fireside chats is to educate the public on how leaders on all levels of government work together in delivering services to those individuals that they mutually, mutually represent. In your roles as congressman and mayor, how do you cooperate in serving those individuals you have been elected to serve? You want to go first? Well, sure. Uh, we, we work together on uh, not as many issues as we do for the state because the state affects us more directly. Uh, the congressman actually held a little breakfast the other morning for us. Uh, a lot of us mayors who came down, chatted with him about issues that do affect not only Round Lake Beach residents, but residents across the country in many ways, uh, whether it be infrastructure, uh, uh, clean water, I'm chairman of the Joint Action Water Agency for Lake County, so I'm very concerned about clean water in Lake Michigan. That's where we get our drinking water from, as well as many other uh, projects that go on. Infrastructure is a big one everywhere, new roads, bridges, water mains, sewer mains. Uh, that's something that they can always help us with. Uh, so some, uh, a few of the small items I asked about were like uh, piers in uh, Round Lake Beach and our small couple small channels here now have to be permitted by the Army Corps of Engineers, which really, to me, seems like a big overreach for a small pier and a small channel. So we're going to talk more about we're, that we're and see if we can get that. something corrected to help our residents. Because for them to go through the whole process to put a little pier in, this seems, again, a little overreach. So, Leslie, let, it's, it's an important question. As you frame the question, I think the most important aspect of it is that we represent 
large po populations. Uh, the mayor represents everyone in, in Round Lake Beach. I re represent everyone in the 10th district. 10th district's a population of uh, over 700,000 people. We're real close to that. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, with a, a lot of uh, diverse interests, diverse experiences, perspectives. Um, and a lot of the people, some people voted for me, some people voted against me, some people didn't even vote. Yeah. But I represent everybody. And I have to understand and, and try to really appreciate the interests and concerns of everyone throughout the district. And that includes understanding the concerns of, of specific communities. So while it doesn't directly relate to um, Round Lake Beach, one of, and you heard us talk about it uh, at the mayor's breakfast, one of the issues is an expansion or uh, trying to ex expand the, the rail line that runs uh, north-south from Lake Forest down into Glenview. Uh, five communities share common concerns, and um, they reached out to me, and just as an example, reached out to me, raised a question, I reached out to uh, the um, uh, Federal Regulatory Administration Authority and said, hey, we need a, a, a full environmental impact, we need to understand the implications. I use that story because it's a reflection, a, a good example of the importance of open communications, the ability to, to talk. We have to be able to talk to each other. Um, on a typical day in my life, I'm not thinking about peers in, in Round Lake Beach, but I do have the ability to reach out to the Army Corps of Engineers and say, help, help me understand your thinking here. What are you trying to do? And let me share with you some of the impact of of, of the process. But without communication, that doesn't happen. So it's really important that we have that ongoing open communication. Uh, and it's not just between the mayor and the congressman, it's everybody. So we have to be able to talk to each other. This is my opportunity for a commercial. Uh, I, I invite everyone to go to the website, schneider.house.gov. Sign up for our newsletter, because that helps me to communicate with you what's happening around the district. I'm here with Sarah Shadnia, two commercials, I'm sorry. Uh, Sarah works, we have a great team. We're here to serve your needs and that runs the gamut from uh, if, if you need a, a renewed passport in a short period of time, we can help with that. We can help with the issues, social security, Medicare, veterans benefits, talk to someone who's helping with that. Anything that touches the federal government, we are your representative on that. So please reach out, we do have uh, scheduled office hours in the Avon Township uh, offices, thank you. We are there every Monday, all day, Monday, and mornings on Tuesday. So uh, our main office here is in Lincolnshire, but our goal is to be out and meeting with you. And even when I'm in Washington, dealing with legislative issues in Washington, uh, Sarah and the team is here serving you. Great. This next question is for both Congressman Snyder and Mayor Hill. Both um, public service is under constant scrutiny and pressure to act. What motivates you to continue with public service and how do you handle the stresses associated with your service? There's no stress. Doriana, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so this is a hard job. Anyone who is, first of all, anyone running for office is putting themselves out there and, and it, it's difficult. And I tip my hat to anyone here who has run for office, who serves in office, thank you. Um, it's, it's a challenge. Being in office, uh, obviously being past an election, it's always better uh, being in office. Yeah, we are faced with the tough decisions and, and, and big issues that come uh, to us. Uh, in, in my role, I am ba balancing, constantly balancing uh, the, the desires of different constituencies, different pr perspectives, and I have to sometimes make hard choices in that. But I'll tell you what makes it easy, or at least continuing in ser service as you ask what makes it easy, is when you have a chance to talk to people who you've made a difference in their life, where you've had a, a little bit of an impact. Um, I met a, a, we had our open house last night, and there's a woman who uh, brought her daughter who ha is, um, uh, I don't have a better word than to say profoundly disabled. She has a genetic disease. Uh, the little bit I, I know about it, it doesn't manifest in, in this case until the young woman was 13 and she's now uh, 16 years old. But uh, unable to communicate, uh, the mother came in with a strap to help hold her up. But when I was in my first term, we were able to help her get into a uh, experimental protocol because without that, this young girl, Cornelia the mother, would not have been able to survive. To have that, and the girl, and she was able to respond with mother's prompting to say thank you, 
Uh, you go home after a night like that with a smile on your face, and that what is what motivates me to continue to do what I'm doing. Uh, we're going to have a hard fight next week uh, trying to protect the Affordable Care Act to make sure that people can continue to get health care. It's not perfect. We need to address it. But we certainly shouldn't throw it out, throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you will, um, and leave fewer people with health care and many of those who continue to have health care paying more for less. We have to continue to move it forward. That's, I know that's going to be a tough battle, but I know it changes people's lives, so that's what motivates me to stay doing what I'm doing and, and happily doing it. Well, my decisions don't have uh, as great of an impact as yours do, uh, but I like to think that we do have a lot of influence on what happens in Round Lake Beach and more, more directly affect the residents and everything in their everyday life. <clears throat> I enjoy what I do. If I don't enjoy it, I'm going to stop doing what I do. Uh, I don't have much stress, thankfully. I'm very really blessed. I've had a good staff. I have a good board to work with, uh, good people all throughout Lake County to work with. It makes it much easier. And yes, sometimes people don't like your decisions. That's just going to happen. And you, you can't please everyone all the time, but we'll try to please as many as we can and, and do what's right for the community and for, and for the residents. And as long as you, you know, feel you've done right, and as you said, it feels so good when you see somebody that's benefited by your decision and, and, and uh, can do something better or their children can have a better life. That's where you really feel it right in your heart. That yeah, but I'll say, I, I think mayor and, and uh, village councils, uh, school board, library boards, these people do have a huge impact in our everyday lives. And uh, you know, I, I think of all the things I come into just this building for, oh, yeah. whether it's uh, today you said you were here for the uh, chamber, chamber meeting. Uh, I've been here for the chili supper. I've been here for this and that, for concerts in the summer. And mano a mano. Mano a mano. A building like this doesn't happen because of Congress. A building like this and the things that make a community uh, every day a little bit stronger is happening because of people like Mayor Hill and uh, in the engagement of all of you being involved yeah. in the community. My goal as a, a representative, as your representative, is try to help make each of our communities a little more successful, a little bit stronger. So yeah. uh, Good for you do all. have a big impact. The following question is for Congressman Schneider. You serve on the House Committee on the Judici Judiciary, the House Committee on Small Business, and the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Can you explain the role of committees? Can you explain the role of committees in the drafting of legislation of providing oversight? Leslie, that's a, a great question. So I, I am fortunate to be on uh, three committees. Small business, I was on uh, small business and foreign affairs when I was in, in the 113th Congress. Small business is the lifeblood of our uh, economy. 90 plus percent of all business entities are small businesses. 65 percent of all new jobs are created by small businesses. 50, more than 50 percent of all people working in the economy today are working in small businesses. But small businesses don't have a voice in Congress. Uh, I use the example of American Airlines and US Air when they were merging. At one point it was reported they had 55 full-time lobbyists on Capitol Hill making their case. Okay? Doing nothing wrong, they just were able to afford to pay people who understood the dynamics of regulation, of antitrust, the legal, their small businesses don't have that. So my role on the Small Business Committee is really to be an ear as well as a voice for small business. And, and that's what I do, advocating to make sure that small businesses are uh, considered in whether it's healthcare, tax policy, you name it, that small businesses is reflected in there. Uh, the second committee, Foreign Affairs, uh, I, I love being on this committee. I'm on two subcommittees, Middle East, North Africa subcommittee, and terrorism, nonproliferation, and trade. I left out I'm the ranking member in the small business, agriculture, energy, and trade subcommittee as well. Uh, and we focus on making sure and overseeing, uh, use that as an example, overseeing um, the State Department, uh, USAID, the agency that provides uh, foreign aid, making sure that our tax dollars are spent wisely, that our diplomats are protected when they're out uh, far afield and, and uh, doing their work, that we're, we're engaging the world in a constructive way. And the third committee, as you mentioned, is judiciary. I asked, this is a new committee for me this year. I asked for that because of a, a number of issues, but in particular, some that I think are very important. Immigration policy uh, starts and, and comes out of the judiciary committee. Uh, gun safety legislation comes out of the judiciary committee. Civil rights, working on the voting, making sure that uh, we can uh, protect and restore the, the Voting Rights Act. And uh, intellectual property, innovation, and linking that to the Small Business Committee. Without innovation, our economy is not going to grow. 
These are all issues that are in the Judiciary Committee. So I'm very excited about the different uh, work I'm doing uh, in each of these committees. You asked how they work. Well, anyone can introduce a bill about anything. And uh, you may have heard the saying, put it in the hopper. Uh, that comes from Congress. The hopper is the tray, actually, actually it was originally in the Senate, but it's the tray where you put in legislation. Uh, any piece of legislation then will be reviewed and uh, it's decided, parliamentarian decides which committees have jurisdiction. So for example, if it's a, a bill dealing with, let's say, sanctions on North Korea or, or the threat of North Korea, that might go to the Foreign Affairs Committee but also the Armed Services Committee because it's, it's military. Uh, if it's a bill in funding for small business, uh, I introduced, we actually passed a bill called the HALOS Act which would help introduce investors and small business entrepreneurs. Uh, that would go to the Small Business and the Financial Services Committee. Each committee then would, uh, if it works the way it's supposed to, have a hearing, bring in what expert witnesses to talk about the substance of the bill, educate the members to understand what it is that they're considering. Uh, after a hearing or two hearings or, or whatever, uh, it goes to something called markup. That's where uh, committee members can offer amendments, decide whether they're going to send it to the full house or not. If it passes markup with a positive um, referral to the house, it would then be voted in the house and uh, up or down. So. Now if there's two different committees it goes to, does each committee have to prove it before it goes to the house? Each committee can have their own markup, it comes together, then there would be conference and uh, and in, in the old days, the committee chairman had a lot of the power. That's not so much true anymore. Uh, you'll see a lot of bills coming to the floor without a hearing, without a markup. Uh, and this is what we're going to see next week if it's true about the, the effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there have been no hearings in this Congress on any of the um, health care bills. They've just gone straight to the floor. It's a different process. The next question is for Congressman Schneider. The world is a fascinating place right now with events in Europe, the Middle East, China, North Korea, and Russia. What role does the House Committee on Foreign Affairs play in the development of any policy decisions or legislative oversight? You got me, give me all the easy questions. <laughs> um, it's a great question. Look, this is what I love about the Foreign Affairs Committee. The, the world is a complicated place. It's always a complicated place. There's no time when it ha has been easy. Uh, and when I'm standing up and, and talking to, to a large crowd on the stump, I'll talk about how chaotic the world is and how much concern. This is certainly a very interesting time, but we've seen more complex, more complicated, more dangerous times. I've got to believe during the Great, Reset, the Great Depression, the world was more complicated. We survived not one, but two world wars, the Civil War. Um, but this is a, a, a time of, of pressures all around. Um, if I had a globe here, we could spin it and just stop it at any point and, and talk about some of the challenges. If we stopped in South America, there's issues in Venezuela, uh, problems there, concerns about the, the future of that government. There's opportunities in Colombia where the two sides after a 50-year civil war have come working towards a reconciliation, but n neither addressing the challenges of Colombia or the opportunities, or challenges of Venezuela or the opportunities of Colombia are going to happen if the United States pulls away. We have to be involved in both of these, and those are conversations that happen uh, in the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, I'll just turn the gl globe uh, clockwise. You know, I go into Africa, and you're seeing some of the real concerns, whether it's Libya, what's happening in Nigeria. Uh, we had some uh, UN workers who were murdered in, in Congo. Um, some governments are on the uplift. Some governments are, are struggling. and, and, and uh, it, in Somalia, you, you even see the risk of, of governmental collapse in, in Libya. But the, the role the United States plays in addressing those problems there. Now, I wasn't, uh, well, I, I did deal with this a little bit, wasn't on the committee, uh, subcommittee, but with the whole Ebola crisis a few years ago, if you remember that. And it was a, a real threat of a global pandemic. But the world came together, and the United States provided a lot of resources, and those get debated and, and let out uh, in conjunction with the administration in the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'm on the Middle East North Africa subcommittee, just continued to go around the world, and you saw the um, uh, bombing, well first the, the chemical attack, I'll even go beyond. The six year civil war in Syria, 500,000 people have died. All right. There's no military solution to the conflict, but the United States working with our allies in the region, working with the rest of the world, 
have to create the, create the forum, the opportunity for a peaceful solution in Syria. That's distinct from what you've seen, uh, the use of chemical weapons by Bashar al-Assad, who in my view and others is a, a war criminal and needs to be held accountable. But chemical weapons are different than anything else, different from civil war. We cannot, as an international community, allow chemical weapons to be normalized. Uh, after World War I, where there was extensive use of chemical weapons, the world said, this is not tolerable. And uh, except for rogue nations, you have not seen the use of chemical uh, warfare. If we normalize it, that's a threat to our men and women in the armed services, it's a threat to civilians um, around the world. So the president took a strike in Syria, debatable whether he had the authority to do so. He's gonna argue that the administration, as the, did the last administration, argued that it was under the authority granted to President Bush in 2003 for Iraq. The foreign affairs is one of the areas where we're gonna debate the authorization for the use of, middle, of military force, a reauthorization, um, before President Trump uh, takes further action in Syria. I believe my, many, most of my colleagues, I think, feel this way because it's only Congress who has the authority to uh, declare war, and, and Congress needs to step up and, and address that. Uh, so you have that, and I can talk about Ar Iran, I can talk about what's happening in Afghanistan, and then you've got the China Sea, and I take a turn north, and you've got North Korea. Uh, we could be here all night talking about uh, f uh, foreign affairs. We talk day in and day, ab day out about these issues um, in, in the, on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And I, I will talk about Last thing, and I'll close on this, I'll talk about uh, a hearing we had. The president's budget cuts our State Department by uh, nearly a third, our investment. Now, unlike other departments, other areas, the State Department doesn't have big pieces of equipment like the military. They, they don't have ships or planes or, or tanks. Um, they, they don't have land. They have people. And it is the people who literally are putting their lives on their line, going out to countries all over the world, representing us, all of us in this room, uh, and putting forward American values and protecting American interests. We can't afford to cut this. It's in the Foreign Affairs Committee where we debated that budget and together, Repu you want to see bipartisanship, turn on the, the Foreign Affairs Committee. Republicans and Democrats said, we need to continue to invest in diplomacy and development, not just defense, because the three go together like a three-legged stool. I took, uh, and I forgot who was the author, I went around the world in 80 days. My joke falls down if I can't remember that. Jules, Jules Verne, if I remembered that, this was really funny. It says, I took Jules Verne 80 days, it took me five minutes to go around the world. <laughs> Congressman Schneider, the Round Lake Area Business Committee was hard hit by the recession of 2008. Large businesses suspended expansion or closed stores. Small businesses, small business owners seem to be hit the hardest. It seems that the larger companies often get the tax incentives or revenue sharing agreements. As a member of the House Committee or on Small Business, what items or issues are being discussed to encourage and or assist small businesses? Great question, Leslie. So this great recession was different than previous recessions because as you touched on, small businesses, small businesses always get hurt in a recession. Okay? But in previous recessions, the recovery it's normally small businesses that lead us out of that recovery. It's small family-owned businesses, the, the corner restaurant where it's the mom and the dad working together and, and willing to make an investment and taking a risk. And because of the, the way this recovery happened, it was, it was very slow and, and uncertain, small businesses were, were reluctant to take that risk. Another issue was small businesses couldn't get capital um, to invest, if, even if they wanted to, to expand, they oftentimes found that roadblock because banks weren't willing to lend to them. They're finally starting to catch up, uh, but it's been a long haul. In the Small Business Committee, there's a number of areas where we've touched on. Uh, one, we talk uh, about and are, are trying to address and have met with uh, and worked with the Financial Services Committee, the issue of lending to small businesses. Right? And the, the, the recession was a consequence of decisions and actions taken by large lending institutions, the large banks, uh, and we need to make sure that never happens again. We need to make sure we never have too big to fail or a house of cards, which, uh, however you want to describe it. Now, to protect against that, we went to some formulas, some constraints, trying to put 
um, safeguards, rails ar around it. But if you have a formula for making a loan to a business, in a small business, oftentimes, they're not going to be able to make the score to, to quite get there. But in a community like Round Lake or any of the other communities within the 10th district, local bankers who know the people, know their business, have been there their entire life, can say, all right, and let's just for sake of arguments, arguments say you need a score of 80. I know Rich, his business idea gets to 75. The bosses at the corporate headquarters say, I can't loan him this money. But I can't figure out how to put into the form that every time I've worked with Rich, he's worked 25 hours a day to make sure he made good on his loan. That there are connections in the community that make his business model not just good, but brilliant. And that's the judgment we need to give back to our bankers. So that's something we talk about in the Small Business Committee. Uh, we talk about the Small Business Administration working to make sure that what are called set-asides, that government contracts that are supposed to be let out to small, women-owned, minority-owned businesses, that those goals are actually being achieved because I can tell you, oftentimes the administrator comes in and says, we tried, we just fell short. All right? Well, the answer is not, well, nice try. The answer should be, try harder because we have to make sure that those small businesses are getting their chance to compete in the economy. Uh, we have too many circumstances in this economy where concentrations of an industry, concentrations of ownership of an industry are putting too much resources into too few hands, leaving too many people behind, too many communities behind. I want to try to expand our economy in a way that the small businesses have that chance, and that's what we talk about on the Small Business Committee. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, putting that money into the hands of the businessman is what's going to expand our economy the quickest and right. put more people to work the fastest and uh, maybe change the equations a little bit that their formulas are called for to allow some of the uh, business know-how to be put in there more so than just the hard numbers because sometimes right. hard numbers don't tell you the whole story. They never do. Yeah. And I say that as a numbers guy. Numbers are important, mm -hmm. but character matters. Uh, the fire in the belly matters. Yeah. Uh, New industries aren't created by people who change old industries. They're created by people who see an entirely different opportunity. Uh, without Steve Jobs, we wouldn't have the iPhones in our pockets. Um, but uh, he didn't take some, a mainframe and turn it into an iPhone. Uh -huh. This question is for both Congressman Schneider and Mayor Hill. There seems to be tension between citizens and law enforcement, federal, local, and state. What role does Congress and the mayor have in supporting guiding and perhaps regulating law enforcement? Let me take that one first because I think I have that, in, in many respects, the, the shorter part of the answer. Um, look, every day our first responders, law enforcement, fire departments, uh, Homeland Security are putting their lives on the line trying to protect us and we need to honor and respect them. At the same time we may need to make sure that the communities within which our first responders are working um, are able to have that mutual respect. And uh, part of that goes in making sure that our first responders have the resources they need, um, whether that be, uh, we've, we've supported uh, grants into communities that allow uh, police and fire uh, departments to buy the equipment they need to, to serve in their community. We need to try to create more resources. Uh, we've gone in, in many places from where you had police officers walking the, the streets, knowing the individuals in the neighborhood, having close relationships so they can identify when something seems out of place, to because of budget constraints, having two police officers, officers driving together in a car, okay, to be, take it to the step further, in many communities they're down to one police officer driving alone in a car, which means they're never getting out, they're never having a chance to, to meet with the people they know. So the role we can play in Congress is working to get more resources down into our communities to provide for um, our, our first responders, uh, to work within our justice system so we're not putting too much burden on our police, but also at the same time uh, holding our police accountable um, when, when things do go awry. So we need, always need to remember that uh, communities are stronger when the services provided to those communities are strong and that among the most important services are the public safety uh, services. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right what you were saying there. Uh, I'd also say the training goes a long ways as far as helping our officers fully understand what their role is, the best way to reduce the situation rather than expand the situation. And right. uh, see that occasionally happens. 
Uh, getting out there in the community has been a great uh, benefit for our, our police officers. They'll be driving down the road sometimes, see a group of kids playing basketball, they'll stop, get out of the car, shoot some hoops with the kids. I mean, that goes so far towards the future of those kids and how they really view the police officers. You know, they're no longer, oh, that's a cop over there. Hey, there's my buddy, you know, he played right. basketball with me. And they, they'll feel much more at ease if there's an issue, going to that person, I need some help. Our National Night Out, we do uh, the first Tuesday in August every year. We have thousands of people come out there. I mean, they have hot dogs, the police officers are going around, they have put a car show together. It's just amazing to watch the interaction with the police officers and all the kids and the adults and just the families. So that, that's a wonderful event. And there's several other things they do throughout the year. And National Night Out's not a congressional thing, but it is national. And it's yeah. happening all over the district. And I realize I'm gonna be out of town that week this year, so I'll miss it. But to be able to go around to communities throughout the district, and each one does it a, a little bit different. Yeah but it is to, to see police officers talking to, to young kids, talking to seniors, talking to everyone in the community. Um, we need to promote more opportunities like that. Yeah. And uh, even dealing with the businesses, uh, our officers were going from door to door, checking in with businesses, getting to meet the people that work there, so if something comes up, they know who to talk to, they know who to call, and again, the, the ease, the, of knowing somebody, it's like your neighbors. If you know your neighbors, things are a lot easier in your neighborhood. And when people are always shut in, it's kind of hard. It doesn't feel right in the neighborhood right. anymore. Yeah, you need to get out there and say hi. This next question is for both Mayor Hill and Congressman Schneider. About a week ago, Senator Tammy Duckworth participated in a roundtable discussion with local mayors in which the topic of infrastructure funding was raised. When it comes to public development and econ economic growth, Infrastructure holds an essential role. As one of the building blocks of any municipality, investments into infrastructure cannot be overlooked. How can state and local governments ensure that proper funding is provided to these communities? Absolutely, uh, and it has to be done not piecemeal, not short term, it needs to be um, substantial, it needs to be long term. The way I describe it is and this is hard coming out of Washington, we need to convince Washington to look more long-term. We need a 20-year national vision for infrastructure. Where are we going as a country? Within that national vision of 20 years, I would argue we would need a 10-year plan. What are the specific steps we take that, that get us down there? And then a, a five-year budget. Unfortunately, what we have done too often, what Congress has done too often, is a few months or a year at a time. Now, I'll let the mayor tell you, he cannot plan infrastructure projects one year at a time. They take years in planning, they take years in development, and they need to know that the funds are going to be there. Congress can do its role by fully funding a, a national infrastructure bill. Uh, there are things we can do on the, the highway trust fund and making sure it has the funds it needs. There are things we can do uh, and it doesn't necessarily affect uh, uh, around Lake Harbor. And I don't know that it will go for the um, peers, but the, the Harbor Maintenance Fund has money that is um, in there, intended for maintenance of our harbor infrastructure that Congress just needs to let out, and we're, we're trying to do that. So there are things we can, should, and have to do to make sure infrastructure around this nation is world-class, not world-lagging, because the rest of the world's investing in infrastructure and drawing the, the attention of businesses, thinking about where do they put their next factory or even headquarters. Well, when Congressman first started talking, he mentioned about 20-year plan and a 10-year plan and five-year funding and all. That's basically what our plan is. Uh, we have a 20-year plan out there for infrastructure, 10-year long-term range, and then five-year pretty solid planning. This year, the next five years, all the way out. And they had to put the funding in place for that, too. And that's why we've been able to accomplish several uh, repairs in the community, new infrastructure, new roads, water mains, sewers. But you're right, if you don't have a plan, you, you really can't go forward. You don't know what it's going to cost, you know what you can do first, what's the benefits are going to be, and, uh, and really with the federal government, I see infrastructure as one of their, their key responsibilities, especially main roads, super highways going across. So it's mentioned. roads, it's rail, but it is the seaports, it is our, yeah. our airports, we have yep. to admit, and all those things. But it's also electrical grid, having a robust, uh, re resilient electrical grid that can, um, no pun intended, weather severe storms. Uh, but also can be protected against uh, cyber attacks from around the world. Uh, that's an infrastructure investment. Uh, the, the drainage system, so when we have heavy rains, they're not flooding our streets or, or flooding our homes. That's part of an infrastructure. Our schools making sure, well, you, you guys take physics this year by any chance? Have you been in the science lab? Have you seen the science labs? 
They're pretty cool, aren't they? The Round Lake High School Science Labs, that's infrastructure. But that's an investment in infrastructure that is going to have a huge return on its investment as people hopefully are inspired to, to learn science, pursue research, and invent the next iPhone. This next question is for both Congressman Schneider and Mayor Hill. As communities age, structural damage caused by natural events can become a common occurrence. Municipalities who suffer from these events may lack the funding necessary to conduct mitigation projects to prevent future disasters. What do you think is the most effective process for allocating aid to these areas? I'm going to use this as a chance to, I'm going to go to a side and I promise to come back directly to the question. Uh, the best way to mitigate the cost of the damage from these uh, increasingly severe storms is to tackle climate change. And we have to address global climate change. It, it is something that is important to me. I, I am leading on in, in Congress. I cheered when 190 nations around the globe came together 18 months ago in an agreement in Paris. I was optimistic when they said our goal is to have 55 percent of the countries who are countries emitting 55 percent of the greenhouse gases sign on within three years so the plan will go into force. Now the rest of the world understands the challenge. It didn't take three years to get that support. It took 10 months and that plan went into force last October. But at the same time now we're seeing this country, the leadership in this country saying we want to pull out of that agreement. I think that would be a disaster because we are experiencing global climate change all around the world, but also here in Illinois and, and here in Lake County. In Lake County, with so much water and so dependent on the, the quality of our water, but the, uh, uh, the rains and, and, and the effect of storms, more severe storms, more intense tornadoes, snow that's supposed to come, doesn't come, however you look at it, has not just a environmental cost, it has a profound economic cost. We do have national funds available in, in case of national disasters. They have become a political football. That should never be the case. You saw that with the uh, Superstorm Sandy in 2012. Uh, you've seen it you know, following Kat Katrina to, to a lesser extent and even in, in the recent storms. We need to make sure that we have proper funding that when communities do need help, uh, they, can, they can get help. Uh, one of the problems, not so much in Lake County, because no one community is, overwhelms the, the percentage, uh, in Des Plaines, which is part of the 10th district, when it floods, when it rains here, when it, when it floods, the, the uh, Des Plaines River will, there's a, a, a lake, big bend, uh, that will always flood and, and flood the homes. Uh, they can almost never, or never, get federal assistance because they're part, part of Cook County and they're a relatively small part of Cook County. So we have to amend the system, I would argue, to address specific needs of local communities and not let, again, the formula create distortions and, and leave people, uh, in this case, bailing their own water. Yeah, we haven't had any big uh, disasters here probably since 1993. We got almost seven inches of rain there in a couple hours and we had some severe flooding here. Uh, hopefully we'll never have that kind of rain again, uh, but we also my predecessors and myself have put a lot of things in place that we can hopefully alleviate if we have the kind of rainfall again. It won't be anywhere near as bad as it was last time. But you're absolutely right. The, the federal government is like the big brother out there that can help when the disaster strikes one little spot. And right. uh, nobody, no one has the resources to, to counter that. And uh, we yeah, all that, have to pull that, together. We, we take care of each other. That's what we do as a nation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Congressman Schneider, if you listen to the national media and the various cable news channels it leads, People to believe that the Republicans and Democrats don't agree on anything. Is that really the case? What are the items that have bipartisan support? So it's not the case. It's a great question. There are opportunities where, where we can come together. And in fact, if you look at most legislation that passes, it often passes unanimous or, or near unanimous. Uh, but there are also some very real differences between the parties. The press is playing for headlines. The press, press is p playing for eyeballs to then sell advertising dollars. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't comment on uh, Bill O'Reilly. Uh, but Bill O'Reilly's departure was not because viewers left. Bill O'Reilly's departure was because, well, because of what he did, but that has precipitated it. But the decision of Fox News was because the advertisers left. News is all about advertisers. And if you can't sell advertising, you can't run their news program i.e. it's also entertainment. 
So in many respects, you have to take the news as entertainment. There's also a problem, and I'll pick on Fox and MSNBC and CNN, but other stations. Too many of us go to the news station that reports the news that we already know. You know, we, when I was, I'm a lot older than you guys. Uh, when I was growing up, there were only a few news stations. So Walter Cronkite reported the news objectively. You didn't know if Walter Cronkite was a Republican or a Democrat. He, there was also the fa fairness doctrine, but you, you had to, if you watched the news, you were allowed to hear both sides. And now we go and we're hearing news on only one side. And that's unfortunate because there are many things taking place in Congress where we are coming together. I'm very proud to be part of something called the Problem Solvers Caucus. This is 25 Democrats, 25 Republicans who are committed to working together to find common ground to push forward legislation that will address the problems we face as a country. That doesn't get reported at all and probably isn't worth reporting, but if I tell you, you'll say, wow, this is a, another good sign. We originally set it at 20 and 20, but so many others wanted to join that we expanded the group to 50 so we could have 25 and 25. There is a demand for that. Um, I've been doing town halls all around the district. Uh, formerly, we've done 10. We've had spontaneous town halls. This is kind of like a spontaneous town hall with a great audience. Again, thank you guys for coming out. The biggest applause line I get is when I talk about the Problem Solvers Caucus and my commitment to find ways to work together, to reach across the aisle. I don't, I, I like saying this in all contexts, but I'm confident in what I believe and what I'm fighting for, that I don't have to prove the mayor wrong to still believe what I believe. But I'm not certain of anything, so certain of anything, that I'm not willing to listen to what the mayor says and maybe learn something along the way. And if we have more of that engagement and interaction, communication, we'll have better solutions. So um, there are opportunities to it. The news is treated as entertainment, um, but know that there are people here working to try to find a path forward. And at our level at the city council, we don't have parties per se, uh, but people have different opinions, and that's what we need. If you have, uh, everyone has the same opinion, well, why have more than one person there? You all have the same opinion. Right. Uh, you don't improve upon an idea, you just have an idea and you're done with it. And uh, we've started out many times complete opposite ideas as far as how we want to go forward, but in the end we work together until we come to an agreement and this will work for everyone. Right. And uh, that's the way democracy should be working. If two partners always have the same opinion, one should probably go fishing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Schneider, what role should Congress play in the gun control considering the increase in violent crime in Chicago? It's not just Chicago, it's around the country. And this is, uh, uh, for a change, I'll give a very short answer, but then I'll give a long one behind it. Um, Congress has to step up and take the responsibility to pass common sense legislation that will respect the Second Amendment rights of people to bear arms, but at the same time address the incredible terrible, devastating scourge of, of gun violence that's af affecting our country. Uh, I, I talk about in our country's long history, this long tradition of parents or grandparents taking their kids out hunting or, or target shooting, teaching them independence, responsibility, safety. That's not where the problem is. We have in too many places a, a new tradition emerging where getting a gun is a rite of passage. People are shooting, and you've seen this in Chicago, but it's not just Chicago, and I, I, I don't ever want Chicago to be the only reference, but it's, it's our uh, hometown. Um, you saw in one weekend shootings between ri rival gangs that were revenge, one shooting another, where one boy shot someone else because his father had been shot, and someone came and shot that boy, all in the same weekend, because guns are so rampant. So what are some sp specific things we can do? Universal background checks. Right now, depending on your numbers, between 32 and 40% of gun sales are not sold with a background check. Okay? If we're gonna keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't be getting them, we need to have those background checks. Um, making trafficking of guns across state lines a federal crime. You talk about Chicago, there's the number one source of illegal guns in Chicago is a gun shop, I'll come to that in a second, but the number two and number three source of those guns are Indiana and Mississippi. People are going across state lines, buying guns and bringing them into Chicago and distributing them. We need to work on that. We need to go after the bad apple gun dealers. Those who should be doing background checks but simply aren't. Those who are selling guns to people who shouldn't be having them even after a background check. And we need to um, 
recognize that it's not just about guns. In a lot of these communities, it's about education, it's about economic development, it's about after-school programs. It's about saying that we need to make sure all of our communities, have, all of our kids in these communities have opportunities to pursue their dreams, that their parents have opportunities to get well-paying jobs to provide for their families, that uh, the resources are there for the police force, the fire departments to take, to take care of these communities. And Congress has a role in every one of those things, and I'm gonna be fighting for those. My first speech was uh, uh, about gun violence. I've introduced legislation trying to reduce gun violence. One simple name, ghost guns are guns. You can go online, buy a, a, a plastic uh, shell of a gun in the mail and separately have the, the metal um, uh, chamber mailed and you have a gun but you haven't had to have a background check. Uh, these are called ghost guns and we need to uh, end that trafficking. So not such a su short answer, but direct. The next question is for Congressman Schneider. What do you believe are some of the larger issues facing the 10th district? <sighs> we, we have a, a number of issues and I'm gonna talk about opportunities as well. For me, the number one issue is and always will be uh, the economy. I learned that in 1992 watching the Bill Clinton's uh, campaign and remember the saying, those that are old enough, it's the economy stupid. Right? If our economy is growing, if people have jobs, if all families feel like they have a stake in our economic uh, opportunity, then tackling all our other problems are, are fairly straightforward. So to me, that's gonna be a, a, a key primary issue. We can't have a growing economy here in the 10th, here in Lake County, if we don't work on our infrastructure. You know, we, I made the joke earlier about getting anywhere in the district in an hour, unless it's rush hour. Uh, we've got a east-west travel problem, right? You guys deal with it every day. We need to invest in that infrastructure so we can move people. But it's not just building road, roads, it's building communities and mass transit systems. Uh, it has to be a piece of it. We have educational challenges. We have some of the best schools in this country in our district, but we have some of the schools that are struggling the most. Every school, every child should have the opportunity for that quality education. So those are some of the big issues. The follow-up question is for Mayor Hill. Mayor, what are the larger issues facing Round Lake Beach and or the entire Round Lake area? Well, some of the uh, same issues, uh, infrastructure. We have uh, a lot that we've improved over the last 20 years, but there's a lot more that has to be improved. We have some old areas, the roads are still crumbling. Uh, most of the water mains we have been able to replace. We have a lot more we're doing this summer. Uh, but there's still areas that we won't be able to touch for another three or four or five years. And uh, that's a, I don't want to say it's unacceptable, but it really is unacceptable. It should be done faster. But the money's just not there to do it all at once. Uh, we've had uh, some certain issues with um, some of the housing that we've been addressing. Uh, some of the houses that, but with respect to foreclosures that went bad or people bought in, they just kind of walked away from it because they couldn't right. afford it. The houses became very uh, run down, and we've been working uh, through grants uh, to get a hold of those houses, just tear them down and clean the lots completely to help the neighborhoods kind of recuperate. When you have a falling down house in the neighborhood, the whole neighborhood starts to deteriorate. And uh, the quicker we can stop that, the better. I think we've taken down six houses already just this year alone. And we have uh, several more in the pipeline coming up. Uh, those are probably the, the two main ones we have. Uh, Education is always a big one. Uh, the inequities between the school districts are something that is a, always a concern. Uh, we have to do what you can do. Uh, and the school districts have done very well under the way it is, but it's really nice to see a little more equitable uh, sharing there on right. that. And making sure that uh, higher education is affordable, accessible yeah. and affordable mm -hmm. uh, for kids throughout the district. As you mentioned, we had the Chamber of Commerce meeting here today. Uh, today was a special day for that. We had scholarships that were given out. 15 uh, students from the Round Lake area received scholarships. And it's just so nice to see all the kids out there that are doing so well and so smart. And uh, what they're going to be doing in the future to take care of us as we age more. So I think our future is in good hands. Right. The final question of the night is for both Congressman Schneider and Mayor Hill. Why would a young person run for office when they see such discourse in today's political environment? Wow, that's a, a great question. <laughs> change can't happen unless good people step up to make that change. That's true at the local offices, it's true at the state level, it's true at the federal level. It's not just about running for office though, it's, it's about making your voices heard, reaching out to your representatives, whether it's the local mayor or the congressman, or even the President of the United States, I'll throw in the Governor, uh, saying this is what we need, this is what we are hoping you will do on our, on our behalf. Everyone's voice is equally valid. Each of us need to 
appreciate that and engage in that. And so if I'm talking to a young person saying, why should you consider about running for office? is because we need you. We need you to engage in the community, try to make our communities what you want it to be. So you guys are seniors in high school. You're going off to CLC to begin your advanced education, to begin pursuing your careers. As you go and gain experiences through life, whether it's going to be a teacher, raising a family, starting a business, doing marketing for a small company or maybe for a Fortune 500 company, those experiences are life experiences that hopefully you'll continue to bring to the rest of us and stay engaged in your community and choose to run for library board to make sure that I promise the library your kids go to are going to be centers of the communities but entirely different than what a library is today because libraries are different than what I grew up with. But if we don't have people on the library board that doesn't happen. The park district, the programs at the park district that help build community need leaders and hopefully you guys will do that. So yeah politics is it can be a nasty sport but knowing that you're affecting your community, you're changing lives, is why we do this and why we need to make sure that young people know that they can do it. And that your voice, by the way, is already valid. You should be reaching out to us as you have tonight. Um, tell your friends and your uh, fellow students they should do the same. Um, but do it throughout your life and that's how we will have the communities we need for our future. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, we need people to first get the right information, uh, educate themselves a little bit on the subjects before they try to speak on them. That always helps. Uh, but if you have different opinions, that's what makes America what America is. Right. And we need to listen to other people's opinions. I, I like to think I'm always just have the best ones, but some, sometimes someone else has a better one. Uh, and that's why we talk and, and work together, and, and we solve our problems that way. Uh, running it like a steamroller will never do you any good. Uh, you're just going to make everyone mad at you, and no matter how good your idea is, they're not going to want it anyway, right. just because of the way you acted about it. So uh, working together, treating each other res with respect, it goes, carries a lot of weight. And uh, when you can convince other people that this is the right way to do it, that goes even farther than anything else. Uh, one of my favorite t-shirt slogans is democracy is a verb. And uh, if we're going to keep our democracy vibrant, we all have to be active in our democracy. Very true. Very true. Well, I did have one more question that uh, I've heard a few different times. Maybe you've heard this question also. Uh, if uh, con is the opposite of pro, is Congress the opposite of pro progress? Sure, it feels that way sometimes. Um, look, I, there's a lot of issues that are in front of the Congress right now. Um, you're going to read this week, next week, uh, about uh, the funding ending on Friday, April 28th, oh, yeah. because the last Congress only passed a funding resolution for six months through uh, April 28th. This is the funding for fiscal year 17, the one where you're in now that ends on, um, uh, on uh, September 30th. Um, we need to make sure that Congress is starting to address and tackle the challenges. But if you think about our past history, and I, I know you're joking, but there are some real things. And I think about, uh, well, Earth Day is coming up on uh, Saturday. Saturday. Right? It's the 47th Earth Day. The first one was in 1970, when Congress passed, a Democratic Congress, and President Nixon signed, a Republican president, the uh, uh, bill that created the Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. They went on to, two years later, pass the Clean Water and Clean Air Act. You talked about water and, and making sure we have access right. to that. Republicans and Democrats working together. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about Social Security, allowing, before Social Security passed in 1933, 50% of all seniors lived below poverty. Wow. Today, that's fewer than 10%, still too high. But Congress came together, worked with the President, passed that. So we have had these great moments. We need to have them again, and that's why I'll throw it back to everybody here. We need to hold our um, representatives at the state level, at the federal level, in the White House, to account and say, let's start working and tackling the challenges our nation faces, and let's do it in a way that is bipartisan, in a way that reflects the interests of everybody, in a way that honors our promises to the generations before us, but keeps the responsibility and obligations that we have to the generations to come. Well, I think we have a couple more minutes if anyone has a question. Uh, use the microphone. Yeah. Do you have a position on the 
refunding of the government you said was going to come up. I forgot totally about that until you mentioned it. Yes. And your position is? Oh, I thought I was going to get away with just that. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we all pay our bills every month, right? We all work to make sure that as hard as it is, we find a way to, to make ends meet and, and hold ourselves to account. The government should do the same. And it's not, what is probably going to happen next week, at the very least has to happen, is a continuing resolution. You'll hear this talk about continuing resolution, which all that says is that the decisions made last year to fund the government at various levels keep funding it that way so at least the doors stay open. Okay? But that's not what should be happening. What should be happening is the debate and the conversation, what are our priorities? Now in life, I'm going to pick on you two again just since you're the moderators and, and young. In life, you're going to learn that you may want to do everything all at once, but you can't do everything at once. And trying to do it all at once is a recipe for failure. You have to make priorities and put things in sequence and make hard choices. C Congress needs to do the same. And uh, I don't think that happens next week. At the very least, they, we can't shut down the government. I was there in 2013 when the government shut down. I will tell you the stories. So I'm in Washington. I have to uh, stay there because we're having votes every day trying to get the government open. But there isn't, there's no hearings going on. Nothing's happening. So I'm calling home, talking to constituents, hearing their stories. It was heartbreaking. And, and one of the hardest stories I had to deal with was a, uh, a gentleman who had young children. He works, and I don't remember if he worked for the EPA and his wife worked uh, at the Navy base or vice versa, but both of them were home. And this guy started literally crying over the phone. How do I tell my kids why I'm home at lunch? I talked to another woman whose daughter was on a ship in Antarctica trying to finish her government-funded research uh, on climate in order to get her PhD. And if the funding didn't come through, her entire four-year effort of uh, research was literally going to fall apart. And she had like a 30-day window on this thing. Um, but it was also veterans getting their health care payment of Social Security benefits. And if you're living on Social Security and Medicare month to month and your medicine, paying for your medicine depends on, upon it, that's uh, just short of a crime not to, to, to fund the government. I went and visited a company in um, uh, Des Plaines, I think. Uh, it's in Cook County. They make products for NASA. They had the product ready to ship, but there was no one at NASA to receive it, and they couldn't get paid until they got uh, the product was delivered, but their employees needed, they had to go to a bank to take a loan. This is the kind of things that happen when government shuts down. Um, we can't afford to shut down the government. Uh, it would be irresponsible, and so I will be, you have my position, you'll know what I'll be fighting for uh, when I, I get back next week. And I just pray, I pray we have, at the very least, a continuing resolution for the rest of the year, and let's start talking about 2018 and have that debate we have to have. I worry that we may have these one, two, three-day things, and it becomes ratings games for the entertainment news programs. Yeah, so. so I know you were out of office last session, uh, but my question is about H.R. 5485. Uh, it was a military appropriations bill. I hope I speak for everyone here when, we, when I say uh, we have an all-volunteer military and it should stay that way. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who voted for that bill. Um, there was a, I guess there was a writer snuck in that would have uh, required teenage girls to sign up for the selective service. And uh, there are 300 politicians who either voted for that bill or have otherwise stated that they support some kind of bring back the draft, require women to sign up, or impose some kind of civil emergency preparedness, which I can regard as a forced labor program. Um, shockingly, 80% of them are Democrats, Obama, Rahm Emanuel, John Stewart, Tulsi Gabbard included. So do you want, uh, w will you stand with the 95% of House Democrats who voted last summer to protect our daughters' equal rights to be used as cannon fodder, or do you s are you out of touch with 95% of your party? Well, I, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't know the bill, first of all, so I, I don't track them by numbers. But uh, I can tell you that Rahm Emanuel wasn't voting in Congress last time, uh, so I'm, I, I'm not sure where that's going. Let me talk more about selective service and military in general. I do support the volunteer military, uh, and I'm very proud that uh, my son, after finishing his college degree, volunteered and decided to go into the Navy um, because, and I, I will share with you some of his reasoning. Um, he was in third grade when 9-11 happened. 
it, it was a formative experience for him. Uh, when he was in middle school, he watched a uh, documentary called Restrepo. I don't know if anyone has, has saw this, but it talked about a forward operating base um, in Afghanistan. And uh, it talked about the intense boredom punctuated by severe, um, I guess, excitement is not the right term, but uh, adrenaline uh, w when there, there is a battle. But that most of these people were coming from communities that uh, didn't have the same opportunities that my son had. And he says, you know what, we all need to stand forward and, and um, serve our country. And different people serve their country in, in different ways. Um, that was my son's choice. Now, in 1979, when I turned 18, it was the first year of the uh, Selective Service. Uh, I remember going to the post office and registering. I also have a, a, a vague rem vaguer memory of the debate about equal rights. It was something I was raised with. And uh, uh, the reason I say it's vague is because we've made, and it's something we still have to keep fighting for, a lot of progress of recognizing that men and women all should have the same opportunities. And, and that includes opportunities of going to school, opportunities of being a teacher, or going into marketing, or going in, into the military. And we've seen progress that we weren't the first, we were actually behind, but women have the chance to, if they choose, serve in combat units, uh, serve in all branches of our military. Um, I support that, and uh, I, I support that need. So, like I said, I'm not familiar with the bill, but uh, I do feel very strongly about uh, men and women having equal opportunities across the board, men and women doing the same work, being paid this, the same wage, and uh, that uh, those who do choose to serve in a volunteer military deserve the honor and respect of all of us, and when they come home, deserve the backing uh, uh, for, of all of us in gratitude for their service. I agree with a lot of what you said right there. That's great. I wish we had time for more questions, but we do have to keep this within an hour program so they can actually get on networks. Otherwise, uh, they cut out a bunch of stuff. So, uh, Congressman, I appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, Mayor, thank you. This was great. I, I love working with you. I look forward to continuing to work in Round Lake and throughout the district. We have a lot to do, and yes. uh, we will be talking uh, many more times. I hope we have a chance to do this again. Great. Thank you. Thank you.